Welcome to Lecture 8 of Advanced Topics in Quantum Information Theory. In this lecture, we will discuss commuting measurement strategies for non-local games, as well as the semi-definite programming hierarchy of Novasquez, Peronio, and Asin, better known as the NPA hierarchy, which closely relates to commuting measurement strategies. Let us begin with a brief overview of the lecture. As I just suggested, we will first discuss a class of strategies for non-local games called commuting measurement strategies, or alternatively as commuting operator strategies. These strategies include all entangled strategies, in a sense that will be made more precise momentarily, and for quite some time this inclusion was not known to be proper. But thanks to the work of William Slostra a few years ago, we now know that this containment is indeed proper. Only recently has it been announced by G. Natarjan, Vitek, Wright, and Ewan that the values defined by entangled strategies and commuting measurement strategies are different, where we take the supremum winning probability over all strategies in the two classes. This turns out to be a very important result with connections to other branches of mathematics, and in particular, it refutes the well known Kahn embedding conjecture, which has been open for about 50 years. The proof is quite complicated, though and we certainly won't make an attempt to discuss it in this course. We will then define the NPA hierarchy, and we will prove that this hierarchy converges to the commuting measurement value of non-local games. This is, in fact, a necessary ingredient in G. Natarajan, Vidic, Wright, and Ewan's proof. Before we discuss commuting measurement strategies specifically, let's consider how we may represent strategies for non-local games generally, and how we may compare different classes of strategies. Let's fix question sets X and Y and answer sets A and B for a non-local game, and you should assume throughout the lecture that these sets are chosen arbitrarily, unless it is explicitly indicated otherwise. When we think about a particular strategy for any non-local game having these question and answer sets, it's natural to focus on the probabilities with which each answer pair AB is produced by Alice and Bob for each question pair XY, and we can arrange these probabilities in a matrix. Specifically, with any given strategy, we can associate a matrix or an operator M having the form shown here. The columns are indexed by question pairs, and the rows are indexed by answer pairs, and the interpretation of the entry indexed by the row or answer pair AB and the column or question pair XY is that the value represented by this entry is the probability that Alice and Bob answer the question pair XY with the answer pair AB. Note, by the way, the notation that's being used here to denote this entry. We're basically mirroring the notation we already used for the predicate V in a non-local game, and we'll stick with this notation throughout the lecture. As a matrix, M stores the various probabilities we're interested in, and it also has a natural interpretation as an operator. It's a stochastic operator, meaning that its columns all form probability vectors, or equivalently, it maps probability vectors to probability vectors. And you can think of it as representing the action whereby Alice and Bob take XY as an input and output each answer pair AB with some probability. Naturally, if we have this matrix for a given strategy, then we can easily compute its winning probability for a given non-local game G through the formula shown on the screen. This formula can alternatively be expressed as the inner product between M and an operator K having the same form as M and defined by the formula shown here. So, the operator M doesn't tell us anything about how a strategy represented by it can be implemented in an operational sense but it does tell us exactly what input-output relation is realized by the strategy and how well it performs in any non-local game of interest. With respect to such a representation, we may consider a class of strategies to be any subset of operators of the form just discussed. And for any class, we define an associated value by taking the supremum of the winning probability for any given non-local game over all of the strategies in that class. For example, let's suppose x, y, a, and b are all equal to the binary alphabet, containing 0 and 1. There are four functions from x to a, and four functions from y to b, and that means that there are 16 deterministic strategies, and they're represented by the matrices shown here. 
Although it isn't written on the screen, these 16 matrices are the tensor products taken in pairs of the two sets of four matrices that represent functions from x to a and from y to b. If we now consider the CHSH game as a specific example and form the matrix K suggested previously, we get this matrix. It's perhaps more clear now that the classical value of the CHSH game is three quarters, as this is the maximum inner product between K and any of the 16 deterministic strategies. And that may be a little bit easier to see if I erase all of the zeros in the matrices like this. No matter which one of the deterministic strategies we consider, at most three of the four ones overlap with the non-zero entries of K. Returning to the general case, where x, y, a, and b are arbitrary, we can think about all of the probabilistic classical strategies as a subset p of the space of operators with which we're representing strategies. And similarly, we can take e to represent the set of all entangled strategies. Here are a few simple observations about these sets. First, they're both convex. For example, if we have two classical strategies, it's possible to define a new classical strategy that uses shared randomness to effectively implement the convex combination of the two strategies. In the case of entangled strategies, convex combinations can also be realized or implemented, and I'll leave that to you as an exercise to think about. The set P, in fact, is not only convex, but it's a polytope. Specifically, it's the convex hull of the representations of deterministic strategies. P is certainly contained in E. The inclusion of P in E is proper, so long as each of the sets X, Y, A, and B has at least two elements. And the fact that the classical and entangled values of the CHSH game are different reveals this. Now we'll move on to commuting measurement strategies. We say that an operator M having the same form as before is, or represents, a commuting measurement strategy if there exists a complex Hilbert space H, a unit vector U contained in H, and two collection of projection operators on H, having the forms shown here, that satisfy the following properties. First, the projections must represent projective measurements for each choice of X and Y. That is, for any choice of x, if we sum pxa over all answers a, then we get the identity operator on h. And likewise, if we sum qyb for any choice of y over all answers b, then we get the identity operator as well. Second, each of the projections pxa must commute with each qyb. And finally, the input-output correlations you would naturally associate with the vector u and the various projection operators agrees with m in the sense of the formula you see written here. Intuitively speaking, you can think of a commuting measurement strategy as a relaxation of an entangled strategy. The projections named with the letter p represent Alice's measurements and the projections labeled with q represent Bob's measurements and the unit vector u represents a pure state shared between Alice and Bob. There is no tensor product structure here, however. The space shared by Alice and Bob is simply h, and in place of this tensor product structure, we substitute the requirement that Alice and Bob's measurements commute. There's one more very important property of this definition to observe, and that is that the Hilbert space h is not required to be finite dimensional. H is an arbitrary complex Hilbert space. Hereafter, let us write C to denote the subset of operators of the form we've been discussing that represent commuting measurement strategies. And let's also define the commuting measurement value of a non-local game G to be the supremum winning probability over all commuting measurement strategies. We'll denote the commuting measurement value by omega with a superscript C, short for commuting. There are various things that we can say about the set C of commuting measurement strategies. Just like the sets P and E of probabilistic and entangled strategies, the set C is convex, and it also happens to be compact. And we'll observe both of these properties by the end of the lecture. Convexity can, however, be proved pretty directly. It is the case that the set of entangled strategies E is contained in the set C of commuting measurement strategies, and this is not too difficult to prove. You can take any entangled strategy 
dilate it to an entangled strategy that uses a pure state and projective measurements by purifying the state and using Neymark's theorem on the measurements, and then choose H to be the tensor product of Alice and Bob's spaces, take U to be the shared pure state, and take each of the projections in the definition of commuting measurement strategies to be the tensor product of one of Alice's measurement operators or one of Bob's measurement operators with the identity operator for the other player. It is known that the containment of E in C is proper, as I said at the start of the lecture. I should also mention that if we restrict H to be finite dimensional, then we actually get precisely the entangled strategies. So it's a critically important aspect of the definition that H can be infinite dimensional. There is no loss of generality in taking H to be a separable Hilbert space, or in other words, a Hilbert space having countable dimension. And that is another fact that will fall out from our discussion of the NPA hierarchy, as we will see. In case you're wondering, by the way, we would not obtain the class C of commuting measurement strategies if we were to extend the definition of entangled strategies to allow the spaces A and B, representing Alice and Bob's parts of a shared entangled state, to be infinite dimensional. The equivalence of E and a restricted form of C for finite dimensional H follows from a special structural property of commuting operators on finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. Next, we're going to discuss the NPA hierarchy, which provides an alternative characterization of commuting measurement strategies. But before we do this, it will be helpful to very briefly summarize a few elementary concepts concerning strings. These concepts will be very familiar to computer scientists, and if you're not familiar with them, it will take just a moment to summarize what we need. Assume that an alphabet sigma has been selected. Mathematically speaking, an alphabet is simply a finite and non-empty set, and intuitively we imagine that the elements of an alphabet represent symbols that could be used to encode information. A string over the alphabet sigma is simply a finite ordered sequence of symbols from sigma. Notice that by definition a string is finite. It is sometimes useful to think about infinitely long sequences of symbols, but we just don't refer to such things as strings. The length of a string is the total number of symbols appearing in it, where we count all of the repetitions of the symbols in case there are repetitions. For example, here are three strings over the binary alphabet, which includes the symbols 0 and 1. The string 0 has length 1, the string 0110 has length 4, and so on. There is a special string having length 0, and it's called the empty string. The empty string doesn't have any symbols in it at all, but it is still considered a string. Obviously, it would be very confusing if we didn't have a special symbol to represent this string, so we'll represent it by the letter epsilon. Just a few additional points concerning notation. For every non-negative integer n, we write sigma with a superscript less than or equal to n to denote the set of all strings over sigma having length at most n. And we write sigma star to denote the set of all strings of any finite length over the alphabet sigma. Finally, if we have a particular string s, we write s with a superscript r to denote the reverse of s, where we simply reverse the order of all the symbols appearing in that string. For example, the reverse of 00010 is 01000. Let us also note that the set sigma star is always countably infinite for any choice of an alphabet sigma, and in particular, we can order the strings in sigma star lexicographically. This is the ordering where strings are ordered in increasing length, starting with the empty string, then all strings of length 1, then all strings of length 2, etc. And within strings of a common length, we order them according to dictionary ordering, which assumes naturally that some total ordering of the alphabet sigma has already been selected. Now we're ready to discuss the NPA hierarchy, starting with an intuitive discussion of the hierarchy. And for the moment, we will be focusing on just the first level of the hierarchy, but the subsequent levels are based on a similar idea. Suppose that we have a commuting measurement strategy represented by an operator m, and realized, let us say, by a Hilbert space h, a unit vector u and h, and collections of projection operators acting on h, like before. Thus, 
the a, b, x, y entry of m is given by the inner product of u with the composition of pxa and qyb acting on u. Now consider the Gram matrix of the collection of vectors written here. As we've discussed a number of times already, this is the matrix whose entries are given by the inner products taken over all pairs of these vectors. There are of course many entries in this Gram matrix that we may not care much about, but among the entries we find all of the values that appear in the matrix M. So the Gram matrix of these vectors tells us really everything we need to know about how well this strategy performs in any non-local game, having question and answer sets x, y, a, and b. The way that we'll index the entries in this Gram matrix is as follows. First, let sigma a be the alphabet obtained by taking the Cartesian product of x with a, so that the symbols in sigma a correspond to question and answer pairs for Alice. And similarly, let sigma b be the alphabet obtained by taking the Cartesian product of y with b, so the symbols of sigma b correspond to question and answer pairs for Bob. Finally, let sigma be the disjoint union of sigma a and sigma b, which means that we consider the alphabets sigma a and sigma b to be disjoint when forming the union. In other words, sigma is the alphabet containing one symbol for each question and answer pair for Alice, and a distinct symbol for each question and answer pair for Bob. Now if you think about the set of vectors from which we're forming the Gram matrix, it's natural that we would label these vectors by strings over the alphabet sigma, having length at most one. The first vector, which is just u, is labeled by the empty string, because it's not acted upon by any projection operator, while the remaining vectors are labeled by either xa or yb, depending on which of the other two sets it's drawn from. Thus, the entire set of vectors can be placed in correspondence with sigma less than or equal to one, the set of all strings having length at most one. And so, the rows and columns of our Gram matrix will also be indexed by this set. Now suppose that R is such a Gram matrix, where each entry is given by the inner product of the two vectors from our set of vectors corresponding to the row and column of that entry. This is a positive semi-definite matrix, or operator, because that is always the case for any Gram matrix. Indeed, being a Gram matrix of some set of vectors is equivalent to being a positive semidefinite matrix. In addition to being positive semidefinite, R has to satisfy some other properties by virtue of the requirements placed on commuting measurement strategies. In particular, we will identify five specific types of conditions, and as we go through them, keep in mind that they're all affine linear constraints on the entries of R. In fact, the first one is affine linear, and the rest of them are linear. First, it must be the case that the epsilon epsilon entry of R, meaning the entry in the row and column corresponding to the empty string, is equal to 1. This is simply because u is a unit vector, so its inner product with itself must be 1. Second, suppose we pick any choice of a question x for Alice, and we sum the entries of R in any column corresponding to an arbitrary string s over all rows indexed by xA where A ranges over all possible answers for Alice. Given that the projection operator PXA, when summed over all A in capital A, must equal the identity operator, we see that the sum of the entries just described must be equal to the epsilon S entry of R. The same equality must hold if we fix a row and sum in the columns corresponding to XA over all answers A for a chosen question X for precisely the same reason and we can apply similar reasoning for a fixed choice of a question y for Bob, summing over all answers b. All of these constraints are obtained by the assumption that Alice and Bob's measurements are complete, meaning that the corresponding measurement operators sum to the identity. Next, we have linear constraints on R that follow from the fact that Alice and Bob's measurement operators within each projective measurement are necessarily orthogonal. That is, for any choice of a question x for Alice, and any two distinct answers a and c for Alice, there must be a zero in R in the xa xc entry, because pxa composed with pxc in this situation must be the zero operator, as the two projections are orthogonal. 
The fourth type of constraint reflects the fact that projection operators must square to themselves. So, for any symbol ZC, which could be either XA or YB, we have that the ZC ZC entry of R must equal both the epsilon ZC and ZC epsilon entries, because as we form the inner products of the various vectors, we get the same value for one or two copies of each projection being present. The final type of constraint reflects the fact that Alice and Bob's measurements commute. So for every choice of XA and YB, the XA, YB, and YB, XA entries must be equal, because it doesn't matter which order the corresponding projections appear as we form the inner products that define these entries. Notice that this type of constraint is limited to entries corresponding to one symbol in sigma A and one symbol in sigma B, as the commutation condition only holds between any one of Alice's projections and any one of Bob's projections. In summary, there are a number of linear constraints we obtain from items 2 through 5 in this list, but note that it is a finite number of linear constraints, naturally. The first constraint from item 1 in the list is the only affine linear constraint, and it's just the single one. Now suppose that we forget about the fact that these linear constraints naturally emerged from the fact that R was formed as a gram matrix from an actual commuting measurement strategy and instead we consider the set of all positive semidefinite operators R that satisfy these constraints. We may then define a set C1 of operators having the same form as before, meaning the form of our matrix representations of strategies, for which there exists some positive semidefinite operator R satisfying all of the constraints and agreeing with M in the sense that MABXY equals RXAYB for all x, y, a, and b, just like we had when r was an actual gram matrix. We do know, by the way, that m has to be real in order for this equality to hold for all x, y, a, and b by the fifth condition, the one we get from commutativity, together with r being positive semidefinite and therefore Hermitian. That is, r, x, a, y, b is always real given the fifth condition plus r being Hermitian. We see that the set C of all commuting measurement strategies must be a subset of C1 because every commuting measurement strategy defines a gram matrix satisfying all of the constraints. The containment does happen to be proper, provided that we have question and answer sets that are large enough, but in any case we do obtain an upper bound on the commuting measurement value of any non-local game G as you see written here. Here, by the way, the operator k is the operator formed from the game g, just like before. This upper bound will not always be tight, but it is something that can be efficiently computed. It's equal to the optimal value of a semidefinite program. One can simply optimize over all positive semidefinite r, satisfying the finitely many affine linear constraints from items 1 through 5 in our list. Given that every entry of m appears as an entry of r, it's straightforward to take whatever linear objective function of m you wish and translate it to a linear objective function of r. This semidefinite program represents the first level of the NPA hierarchy. The idea for extending the hierarchy to higher levels is to consider not the gram matrix of the collection of vectors from before, where we had one vector for u, one vector for each of Alice's projections, and one vector for each of Bob's projections, but instead to add more vectors corresponding to higher degree products of these projections. For example, in addition to the vectors from before, we could also throw in PXA, QYB, PZC times U, where the projections are mixed up in every possible combination up to a given length. The degree or the length of these products corresponds to the level of the hierarchy being considered. If we follow the same prescription as we just discussed, but we include these vectors corresponding to higher degree products of the projection operators, then the rows and columns of the resulting gram matrix will be indexed not by strings having length at most one, but by strings of length at most k for whatever level k of the hierarchy we choose. 
Now, when we do this, we'll end up with much larger gram matrices, and it might seem that we don't gain much because most of the entries in the gram matrices we construct in this way won't tell us directly anything about the probabilities with which Alice and Bob's answers are distributed for each question pair. But there is in fact an advantage, and that is that additional constraints are added when we consider the various properties through which the five constraint types from before were derived. Indeed, as we will show, the hierarchy of semi-definite programs we obtain by doing this will in fact converge to the commuting measurement value in the limit as the level of the hierarchy goes to infinity. Next, let us formally define the NPA hierarchy. We have discussed the intuition, but naturally we require greater formality in order to show the convergence just suggested. First, we define an equivalence relation, which we denote by a tilde-shaped binary operation, on strings over the alphabet sigma, which is defined in the same way as before and repeated here for convenience. Specifically, this equivalence relation is generated by three rules. The first two rules say that every string is equivalent to the string obtained by repeating any one symbol. And this condition will be used to reflect the fact that projections always square to themselves. The third rule says that every string is equivalent to one in which two adjacent symbols, one chosen from the alphabet sigma A and one from sigma B, are swapped. This condition will reflect the commutation property between Alice and Bob's measurement operators. When we say that the equivalence relation is generated by these rules, we mean that the equivalence relation is the smallest equivalence relation satisfying these three rules, which is equivalent to saying that any two strings are equivalent if you can get from one to the other by applying the three rules in any order any number of times. Next, when we think about the gram matrices that would be defined by the sets of vectors suggested previously, assuming that there really is a commuting measurement strategy defining these gram matrices, we see that all of the values appearing in the matrices must be the outputs of a function phi from strings to scalars defined as you see here. That is, if we have a commuting measurement strategy and we form a gram matrix as suggested before, then each entry in the gram matrix will be given by the function phi according to the formula written here. The st entry of r is equal to phi of the reverse of s concatenated with t. That's because each projection is its own adjoint, and the projections can be flipped one at a time from the left-hand side of each inner product to the right, which naturally reverses the order of the symbols. We're making note of this particular fact simply because it will make it a lot easier for us to express all of the constraints we need to account for, and as the level of the hierarchy gets larger, there are more and more of them. But all of the constraints we will consider can be expressed as conditions on the function phi, together with the formula written here for the st entry of r. So we can simplify the description of these constraints by focusing on this function phi rather than focusing on the entries of r. With that in mind, let's say that a function phi from strings over sigma to scalars is admissible if it satisfies these properties. First, phi of epsilon equals one. This translates to exactly the condition from before that the epsilon epsilon entry of r is equal to one. Second, the equalities written here are always satisfied for every choice of strings s and t and questions x and y. This condition reflects the completeness of Alice and Bob's measurements. Third, for any choice of strings s and t, and for any question x in capital X and distinct answers a and c in capital A, phi of s concatenated with xa concatenated with xc concatenated with t must equal zero. And likewise for any question y in capital Y and distinct answers b and d from capital B. This condition reflects the fact that the projections corresponding to Alice and Bob's measurements must be orthogonal within each measurement. And finally, if we have two strings that are equivalent with respect to the equivalence relation we defined a few moments ago, 
the function phi must take the same value on these strings. That's the definition of what it means for a function phi to be admissible, that it satisfies all of these constraints. And we see that these conditions follow from precisely the same properties of commuting measurement strategies that gave us the five constraints from when we discussed the first level of the NPA hierarchy at a more intuitive level. There are only four this time because the last one here corresponds to two from before. The equivalence relation reflects both the fact that projections square to themselves and the commutation relation between Alice and Bob's projections. It's also convenient to use the same terminology and essentially the same definition for functions phi of a similar form as on the previous screen, but restricted to strings of length at most k for whatever choice of k one might wish to consider. To be specific, the conditions listed on the previous screen only need to hold for those choices of s and t that are sufficiently short so that phi is defined within each condition. Finally, a positive semidefinite operator R, whose rows and columns are indexed by strings of length at most k, will be said to be a kth order admissible operator if there exists an admissible function phi defined on strings of length at most 2 times k, such that the same equation from before is satisfied for all strings s and t having length at most k. That's all a bit technical, but from a high-level viewpoint, what we've done is to define a class of functions phi where various affine linear constraints on its outputs must hold, and then we've defined a class of positive semidefinite operators R whose entries are given by outputs of the function phi. And if you think about this for a moment, you'll see that the condition that a given positive semidefinite operator R is kth order admissible is an affine linear constraint. Although the affine linear constraints on the outputs of phi and therefore on the entries of R become more and more complex in some sense as k grows, there are just a finite number of them. It's all just a way to describe the constraints that would necessarily hold for any gram matrix of the sort suggested previously based on the same simple properties of commuting measurement strategies as before. U must be a unit vector, Alice and Bob's measurement operators must form complete projective measurements, and Alice and Bob's measurement operators commute in pairs. In any case, we see that the optimization overall kth order admissible operators can be expressed as a semidefinite program. And this is what is known as the NPA hierarchy, where different choices of k correspond to different levels of the hierarchy. Once again, you can consider whatever linear objective function you like, but it's typical that the objective function corresponds to the winning probability of some non-local game, or alternatively, one can set up a semi-definite program to test the feasibility of a given choice of m to see if it is consistent with some kth order admissible operator. We will now consider the convergence of the NPA hierarchy, and to this end, let us define for each positive integer k, a subset ck of operators containing every m that is consistent with some kth order admissible operator r, in the same sense as before when we defined c1. For the sake of convenience, we'll call each such operator m a kth order pseudo-commuting measurement strategy. This definition is consistent with the definition of c1 from before, We've just used the notion of an admissible function to define this set in a way that makes it easier to handle larger values of k. We may begin by observing two facts. First, ck plus 1 is always included in ck for every positive integer k. So we get a sequence of sets that don't get any larger and in some cases get smaller. That's consistent with the idea mentioned earlier, which is that we're effectively adding constraints as we move up in the hierarchy. A simple way to see that these containments hold is to observe that if you take any k plus first order admissible operator and then delete all the rows and columns corresponding to strings of length k plus 1, you'll be left with a kth order admissible operator. Second, the set C of commuting measurement strategies is contained in every one of the sets CK. And that's because if we have an actual commuting measurement strategy, then we can always use this strategy 
to define a gram matrix R, indexed by strings of whatever length we choose, that must satisfy all of the constraints that we've discussed. So every commuting measurement strategy is a kth order pseudo commuting measurement strategy for every positive integer k. In the remainder of the lecture, we will prove that the sequence of sets C1, C2, C3, etc. converges to C. We'll state this as a theorem as we have here. For any choice of finite and non-empty question and answer sets, we have that C equals the intersection of all CK taken over all positive integers K. That is, for every operator M of the form that we have been discussing in the lecture, it is the case that M represents a commuting measurement strategy if and only if M is a kth order pseudo commuting measurement strategy for every positive integer K. We've already observed that statement one implies statement two, or equivalently that C is contained in CK for every K, but it will take just a moment to express this with a bit more formality. Under the assumption that M is a commuting measurement strategy, we have that there exists some Hilbert space H, a unit vector U in H, and a collection of projective measurements that give rise to the operator M. Let us write pi zc to denote either pzc or qzc, depending on whose question and answers zc refers to. And if we define a function phi as is written here, which is the same way that was suggested previously, and we define an operator r using the same formula as before, then it can be checked that r is indeed a kth order admissible operator that's consistent with m. And so m is a kth order pseudo commuting measurement strategy. That's the easy implication naturally, and the other implication is more challenging. The first step toward this more challenging implication is to prove a bound on the absolute value of any entry of any kth order admissible operator. Specifically, the absolute value of every entry of such an operator is at most one. To prove this bound, we first note that because R is positive semi-definite, Every two by two principal submatrix of R must also be positive semi-definite. And so we have the simple bound you see here on the absolute value of any off-diagonal entry of R in terms of the diagonal entries of R. Because the diagonal entries must be non-negative real numbers, as is always the case for a positive semi-definite operator, it will suffice to prove that each of these diagonal entries is at most one. We can prove this bound by induction on the length of S, the string indexing whatever diagonal entry we're talking about. The base case is that S is the empty string, and we already know that the diagonal entry of R corresponding to this string is equal to one. In general, for any choice of a string S and any symbol ZC chosen from sigma, we can bound the diagonal entry of R corresponding to the string ZC concatenated with S as follows. This diagonal entry is no larger than the sum of the diagonal entries over all answers to the question z, not just c, because the diagonal entries are all non-negative. By the formula for the entries of r, written in terms of some admissible function phi, we can express the sum as is shown here, and using the fact that two repetitions of the symbol zd is equivalent to the string where we have just one occurrence of that symbol, followed by the constraint on phi that reflects the completeness of the measurements, we obtain the value phi of s reverse concatenated with s, which is just the ss entry of r. And so the bound on the diagonal entry of r corresponding to zc concatenated with s follows from the hypothesis of induction. And now that we have that bound, we can proceed with the required implication. We assume that M is a kth order pseudo commuting measurement strategy for every K, and our goal is to conclude that M is, in fact, a commuting measurement strategy. Let's let RK denote any kth order admissible operator consistent with R, and let phi K be the admissible function from which RK is defined for every positive integer K. The next step is to observe that there exists an infinite matrix R whose rows and columns are indexed by the set of all strings over sigma that has three properties. First, every finite principal submatrix of R must be positive semi-definite. Second, 
R agrees with M in the same sense as each of the RK operators agree with M, as you see here. And third, the ST entry of R is given by phi of S reverse concatenated with T for some admissible function phi. It is important to note here that R is not an operator. It's a matrix. In infinite dimensions, we have to draw a distinction between operators and matrices. For example, and this does happen in the case at hand, the action of a matrix R on a vector having entries indexed by sigma star, according to matrix vector multiplication, might not be square summable. So we could, in some sense, map a vector having finite Euclidean norm to one having infinite Euclidean norm, which isn't a valid action as a linear operator on a Hilbert space. So we won't be thinking about R as an operator, it's just a matrix. The properties of this matrix do, however, mirror those of kth order admissible operators. The requirement that every finite principal submatrix is positive semidefinite is analogous to the operator being positive semidefinite. We have agreement with M in the same sense as before, and the entries of R are determined by the same formula as before, this time for an admissible function phi that's defined for all strings, not just strings up to a given length. In fact, it is pretty straightforward to obtain such a matrix R. The way we'll do this is to first define the function phi, which will be admissible, and then we'll let R be defined from phi according to the formula in the third requirement and then we'll verify the two remaining requirements. Recall that what we have is a sequence of admissible functions, phi k, one for each positive integer k, with each one being defined for strings having length up to 2 times k. Each of the values output by phi k will be an entry of the kth order admissible operator rk, and therefore these values are at most one in absolute value, as we proved a few moments ago. Thus, if you consider any one string s and you think about the sequence of values you get by evaluating phi k on s for any increasing sequence of values of k, you'll find that this is a bounded sequence, and therefore it has to have at least one limit point, also called a point of accumulation. That is, there has to be a convergent subsequence of this sequence. By the way, phi k won't be defined for a given string s when k is too small, but here we're looking at the limiting behavior of these sequences, and nothing is lost if we just ignore the undefined entries in the beginning. There are at most finitely many of them, and they naturally don't influence the limit points of the sequence. So, what we'll do is to start with s being the empty string, and k1, k2, k3, etc. being the sequence of all positive integers, and then we'll consider the process shown here. First, we define phi of s to be any limit point of the sequence just discussed for whatever the current choice is for s and k1, k2, k3, etc. And then we'll restrict our attention thereafter to any subsequence of these indices corresponding to a subsequence of the values of phi k of s that converges to whatever limit point we selected. We then increment s with respect to the lexicographic ordering and repeat. The process never ends, and it defines phi of s for every string s. It's not too hard to see that the function phi defined in this way will in fact be admissible, and that's because each of the functions phi k is admissible. They all obey the constraints required of admissible functions, and these constraints remain in place as we take limits. Notice that it's important that, at each step of the process that defines phi, we're whittling down the sequence of values of k being considered, so that the convergence of each subsequence is effectively preserved as the process goes on. At this point, we may define r in the same way as before, that is, the st entry of r is equal to phi of s reverse concatenated with t for every choice of strings s and t. And if we do this, we observe that any finite submatrix of R is necessarily equal to the limit of some convergent subsequence of the corresponding submatrices of the sequence R1, R2, R3, etc. Again, this is because we're constantly reducing the set of indices corresponding to the subsequences being considered. If a sequence converges to some point, then so does every subsequence of that sequence.
The three required properties now follow. First, every finite principal submatrix of R is positive semidefinite. And that's because each principal submatrix of each RK is positive semidefinite, given that each RK is positive semidefinite. Each finite principal submatrix of R is therefore the limit of a convergent subsequence of these positive semidefinite submatrices. And the positive semidefinite cone is closed. The second property is actually immediate. Every one of the RK operators agrees with M in the usual sense, so naturally this property is maintained as we take limits. And finally, the third property is true by the definition of R, along with the fact that phi must be admissible, as we already observed. Now that we have the infinite matrix R having the properties just discussed, we can verify that M has to be a commuting measurement strategy. To do this, we'll make use of a fact concerning matrices of countably infinite dimension for which all finite principal submatrices are positive semidefinite. And that fact is that any such matrix must be a Gram matrix of a countably infinite set of vectors chosen from some Hilbert space. That's not a trivial fact to prove, but we'll take it as given. To be more precise in the case at hand, there must exist some Hilbert space K and a collection of vectors u sub s chosen from k, one for each string s over the alphabet sigma, such that the st entry of r is equal to the inner product of u sub s and u sub t for every choice of strings s and t. And at this point, we can define the objects we need in order to conclude that m must be a commuting measurement strategy. First, take h to be the closure of the span of the vectors whose existence we just observed. When we refer to the span, we're talking about finite linear combinations, and so we have to take the closure of this set in order to get a Hilbert space. This is a countably infinite set of vectors we're talking about, and therefore H is a Hilbert space of countable dimension, and therefore it's a separable Hilbert space. The unit vector for the strategy will be U sub epsilon, which has to be a unit vector, because the inner product of it with itself agrees with the epsilon epsilon entry of R, which must be one. And finally, we can define the projections associated with this strategy as is written here. Specifically, we take PXA for each question and answer pair XA for Alice to be the projection onto the orthogonal complement of the set of vectors you see written here, which is the set of all vectors corresponding to a string that begins with xc, for c being different from a, and the projection qyb for bob is defined analogously. The orthogonal complement of any set of vectors is always a closed subspace, and that's a requirement for any projection on h. Projections have to correspond to closed subspaces. Now all that's left is to verify that these projections represent complete projective measurements, that each PXA commutes with each QYB, and of course that this strategy is consistent with M, the strategy we started with. All of these verifications will make use of a simple fact about the projections and vectors under consideration. And that is, if you act with the projection PXA on the vector U sub S, you'll always get the vector U sub XA concatenated with S. In other words, by projecting according to PXA, you effectively concatenate the symbol XA onto the string labeling the vector, and similarly for QYB rather than PXA. To prove this useful formula, observe that for any question X for Alice, and any two different answers A and C, and any two strings S and T whatsoever, it must be the case that the vectors uxas and uxct are orthogonal. That's because the inner product equals the xas xct entry of R, which is given by the value of the admissible function phi at s reverse, concatenated with xa, concatenated with xc, concatenated with t. And because we have xa and xc next to each other and phi is admissible, this value is zero. By exactly the same reasoning, the vectors uybs and uydt must be orthogonal for two different answers b and d to the question y for Bob, 
What that means is that PXA acts trivially on any of the vectors UXAS, where the corresponding string starts with XA, and likewise for QYB rather than PXA, as is shown on the screen. This is because PXA is the projection onto the orthogonal complement of a collection of vectors that we just verified are all in fact orthogonal to UXAS. So the vector UXAS has to be contained in the subspace onto which PXA projects. The reasoning is the same naturally for QYB rather than PXA. Next, suppose that we have any question X and any two strings S and T. If we sum the inner product of u sub t with u sub x a s over all answers a to the question x, we find after a similar sort of reasoning to what we just saw, but using the property of admissible functions that corresponds to the completeness condition for measurements, that we get the inner product of u sub t with u sub s. And what this implies is that u sub s must equal the sum over all answers a of u sub x a s. That is, the only way that two vectors can have the same inner product with every vector u sub t is that they are the same vector. There is a simple continuity argument in there, by the way, because h is the closure of the span of the vectors u sub t, ranging over all strings t, but the inner product is continuous in both arguments, so this isn't a problem. The same sort of relationship holds for one of Bob's questions y in place of Alice's question x, as expected. And this gives us the formula we're after. To evaluate the action of PXA on US, we can simply expand US according to the formula we just observed. And by definition, PXA annihilates all of the vectors in the sum except the one corresponding to the answer A, and it leaves this one alone. And that's the formula we want. The argument is the same, of course, for the action of QYB on U sub S, which yields U sub YB S. With this formula in hand, we can quickly verify the properties we need. First, for any choice of strings S and T, and for any two projections PXA and QYB, we can evaluate the inner product shown here by first using the formula, and then following the same sort of reasoning we've now used a couple of times. But this time, we use the property of admissible functions that corresponds to the commutation relation. After reversing direction, we get almost the same inner product as the original one, except the two projections have switched places. The only way two operators can agree in this way for all choices of S and T is that the operators are the same, once again by continuity, given that H is the closure of the span of the vectors U sub S, ranging over all strings S. By using the formula again, we can verify that the sum of PXA over all A for any choice of X is the identity operator, and likewise for QYB. Once the action of the projection operators is expressed in terms of the strings to which the vectors correspond, these verifications are simple. To complete the proof, we just need to verify that the commuting measurement strategy induced by the vector u sub epsilon and the projection operators PXA and QYB actually agrees with M, which is the strategy we started with, which we know is compatible with the infinite matrix R. Once again, we can do this by reaching for the same formula through which the requirements we've already checked were verified. In this case, the XAYB entry of R is equal to the inner product of the vectors U sub XA and U sub YB. And these vectors must agree on the action of PXA and QYB on the string U sub epsilon. This means that the ABXY entry of M is consistent with the inner product of U sub epsilon with a composition of PXA and QYB acting on U sub epsilon, because we already know that M is consistent with R. And so M is indeed a commuting measurement strategy. And that is the end of the proof. To conclude the lecture, let's note a couple of implications of the theorem and its proof. First, as was already mentioned, we find that the set C of commuting measurement strategies must be closed. And that's because each of the sets CK must be closed, 
for every choice of k, and the intersection of any collection of closed sets is always closed. Each CK is closed, by the way, because the set of all kth order admissible operators is compact, and we get C sub k by projecting onto a subset of the entries of these operators. By similar reasoning, C is convex, although this isn't difficult to prove through a more direct argument. Second, we find that there is no generality lost in restricting our attention to separable Hilbert spaces in the definition of commuting measurement strategies. This is because we can start with a commuting measurement strategy defined for an arbitrary Hilbert space, which implies that the strategy is contained in CK for every K. And then through the proof, we can construct a new commuting measurement strategy that's defined over a separable Hilbert space H. And that's all for this lecture and for the course. I did intend to cover more topics, but unfortunately I ran out of time. I do intend to make more video lectures, but for a while my plan is to focus on more basic material. Thanks to everyone who watched this far, and I hope you've found the lectures to be educational. Goodbye for now.